Below Below by Hans Vidmer, Asa Pili, Ibu. In fact, there's really only the Ibu and nothing else. But the Ibu is unreliable, paradoxical, perverse. There's only one single Ibu, but nevertheless, it behaves as if there were four billion or so. The Ibu also knows that it invented the world and reality by itself, yet it still firmly believes that these hallucinations are real. The Ibu could have dreamed an agreeable, unproblematic reality, but it insisted on imagining a miserable, brutish, and contradictory world. It has dreamed a reality in which it is constantly tormented by conflict, catastrophe, crisis. It's torn between ecstasy and boredom, between enthusiasm and deception, between tranquility and agitation. It has a body that needs 2,000 calories a day, that gets tired, cold, gets ill. It expels its body every 70 years or so, a lot of unnecessary complication. The Ibu's external world is a continuing nightmare. Enervating dangers keep it caught between fear and heroism. All the while, it could end this ghastly theater by killing itself and disappearing forever. Since there's only one single Ibu in the universe that it has dreamed up for itself, it has no care about surviving dependents, mourning friends, unpaid bills, etc. Its death would be absolutely without consequences. Nature, humanity, history, space, logic, everything disappears together with it. The Ibu's toils are completely voluntary, and yet it affirms that it's only a powerless element of a greater reality. Why all of this self-deceit? Apparently, the Ibu is in love with its own masochistic nightmare of torture. It has even protected this nightmare scientifically against nothingness. It defines dreams as unreal, so its nightmare becomes a dream of the unreality of dreaming. The Ibu has locked itself into the reality trap. Natural laws, logic, mathematics, scientific facts, and social responsibilities form the walls of this reality trap. As the Ibu insists upon dreaming its own powerlessness, power comes from exterior instances to whom the Ibu owes its obedience. God, life, the state, morality, progress, welfare, the future, productivity. On the basis of these pretensions, it invents the sense of life, which it can never reach, of course. It feels constantly guilty and is kept in an unhappy tension in which it forgets itself and its power over the world. In order to prevent itself from recognizing itself and finding out the dream character of this reality, the Ibu has invented others. It imagines that these artificial beings are like itself, as in an absurdist drama. It entertains relations with them, loving or hating them, even asking them for advice or philosophical explanations. So it flees from its own consciousness, delegating to others in order to be rid of it. It concretizes the other Ibus by organizing them into institutions, couples, families, clubs, tribes, nations, mankind. It invents society for itself and subjects to its rules. The nightmare is perfect. Only if there are accidental cracks in its dream world does the Ibu deal with itself. But instead of terminating this perverse existence, the Ibu pities itself, stays dead by remaining alive. This repressed suicide is displaced outwards to reality and returns from there back to the Ibu in the form of collective apocalypse. Nuclear holocaust, ecological catastrophe. Too weak to kill itself, the Ibu looks to reality to do it for it. The Ibu likes to be tortured, so it imagines wonderful utopias, paradises, harmonious worlds that of course can never be realized. These only serve to fix up the nightmare, giving the Ibu stillborn hopes and instigating it to all kinds of political and economic enterprises, activities, revolutions, and sacrifices. The Ibu always takes the bait of illusions or desires. It doesn't understand a reason. It forgets that all worlds, all realities, all dreams, and its own existence are infinitely boring and tiresome, and that the only solution consists in retiring immediately into comfortable nothingness. Below. The Ibu is still around, refusing nothingness, hoping for a new, better nightmare. It's still lonely but it believes that it can overcome its loneliness by some agreements with the other four billion Ibus. Are they out there? 
you can never be sure. So together with 300 to 500 Eboos, the Ebu joins a Bolo. The Bolo is its basic agreement with other Eboos, a direct personal context for living, producing, dying. The Bolo replaces the old agreement called money. In and around the Bolo, the Eboos can get their daily 2,000 calories, a living space, medical care, the basics of survival, and indeed much more. The Ebu is born in a Bolo. It passes its childhood there, is taken care of when it's ill, learns certain things, tinkers around, is hugged and stroked when sad, takes care of other Eboos, hangs out, disappears. No Ebu can be expelled from a Bolo, but it's always free to leave it and return. The below is the Ebu's home in our spaceship. The Ebu isn't obliged to join a below. It can stay truly alone, form smaller groups, conclude special agreements with belows. If a substantial part of all Ebu's unite in belows, money economies die and can never return. The near complete self sufficiency of the below guarantees its independence. The belows are the core of a new, personal, direct way of social exchange. Without Belows, the money economy must return, and the Ebu will be alone again with its job, with its money, dependent on pensions, the state, the police. The self-sufficiency of the Below is based on two elements, on the building's equipment for housing and crafts, Sibi, and on a piece of land for the production of most of its food, Kodu. The agricultural basis can also consist of pastures, mountains, fishing and hunting grounds, palm tree grows, algae cultures, gathering areas, etc., according to geographical conditions. The below is largely self-sufficient so far as the daily supply of basic food is concerned. It can repair and maintain its buildings and tools by itself. In order to guarantee hospitality, sila, it must be able to feed an additional 30 to 50 guests or travelers out of its own resources. Self-sufficiency isn't necessarily isolation or self-restraint. The Belows can conclude agreements of exchange with other Belows and get a larger variety of foods or services. This cooperation is bi- or multilateral, not planned by a centralized organization. It's entirely voluntary. The Below itself can choose its degree of autarky or interdependence according to its cultural identity, NEMA. Size and number of inhabitants of Belows can be roughly identical in all parts of the world. Its basic functions and obligations, sila, are the same everywhere. But its territorial, architectural, organizational, cultural, and other forms of values, if there are any, can be manifold. No below looks like any other, just as no ibu is identical with any other. Every ibu in below has its own identity, and below below is not a system, but a patchwork of microsystems. Belows don't have to be built in empty spaces. They're much more a utilization of existing structures. In larger cities, a below can consist of one or two blocks, of a smaller neighborhood, of a complex of adjacent buildings. You just have to build connecting arcades, overpasses, using first floors as communal spaces, making openings in certain walls, etc. So a typical older neighborhood could be transformed into below like this. Larger and higher housing projects can be used as vertical belows. In the countryside, a below corresponds to a small town, to a group of farmhouses, to a valley. A below needn't be architecturally unified. In the South Pacific, a below is a coral island, or even a group of smaller atolls. In the desert, the below might not even have a precise location. Rather, it's the route of the nomads who belong to it. Maybe all members of the below meet only once or twice a year. On rivers or lakes, belows can be formed with boats. There can be belows in former factory buildings, palaces, caves, battleships, monasteries, under the ends of the Brooklyn Bridge, in museums, zoos, at Knott's Berry Farm, or Fort Benning, in the Iowa State House, shopping malls, the University of Michigan football stadium, Folsom Prison. The belows will build their nests everywhere. The only general features are their size and functions. Sila. From the point of view of the Ibu, the below's function is to guarantee its survival, to make its life enjoyable, to give it a home or hospitality when it's traveling. The agreement between the whole of the below's, below below, and a single Ibu is called Sila. As the Ibu hasn't any money, nor a job, nor any obligation to live in a below, 
All below is have to guarantee hospitality to arriving single eboos. Every below is a virtual hotel. Any eboo is a virtual non-paying guest. We're only guests on this planet anyway. Money is a social agreement whose observance is enforced by the police, justice, prisons, psychiatric hospitals. It is not natural. As soon as these institutions collapse or malfunction, money loses its value. Nobody can catch the thief, and everybody who doesn't steal is a fool. As the money agreement functions badly, is in fact about to ruin the planet and its inhabitants, there is some interest in replacing it with a new arrangement. Sila, the rules of hospitality. Sila contains the following agreements. Taku, every ibu gets a container from its below that measures 50 by 50 by 100 centimeters and over whose contents it can dispose at its will. Yalu, any ibu can get from any below at least one daily ration of 2,000 calories of local food. Gano, Every ibu can get housing for at least one day in any below. Bete. Every ibu is entitled to appropriate medical care in any below. Fasi. Every ibu can travel anywhere at any moment. There are no borders. Nami. Every ibu can choose, practice, and propagandize for its own way of life, clothing style, language, sexual preferences, religion, philosophy, ideology, opinions, etc wherever it wants and as it likes. Yaka, every ibu can challenge other ibu or a larger community to a duel according to those rules. Nugo, every ibu gets a capsule with a deadly poison and can commit suicide whenever it wants. It can also demand aid for this purpose. The real basis of the sila are the belows. Because single ibus wouldn't be able to guarantee these agreements on a permanent basis, Sila is a minimal guarantee of survival offered by the belows to their members and a certain proportion of guests. A below can refuse Sila if there are more than 10% guests. A below has to produce 10% more food, housing, medicine, etc. than it needs for its stable members. Larger communities like the Tega or Vudo handle more resources should certain belows have surpluses or if more than 10% guests show up. Why should the belows respect hospitality rules? Why should they work for others, for strangers? Belows consist of ibus, and these ibus are potential guests or travelers too. Everybody can take advantage of hospitality. The risk of abuse or exploitation of the resident ibus by the traveling ibus is very low. First, a nomadic lifestyle has its own disadvantages, since you can then never participate in the richer inner life of a below. A traveling ibu has to adapt to a new cuisine and culture, cannot take part in long-term enterprises, and can always be put on a minimum ration. On the other side, travelers can also benefit the visited community. Traveling can even be considered a form of work. Travelers are necessary for the circulation of news, fashions, ideas, know-hows, stories, products, etc. Guests are interested in fulfilling these functions because they can expect better than minimal hospitality. Hospitality and traveling are a level of social exchange. A certain pressure to respect hospitality is exerted on the belows by a munu, honor or reputation. The experiences had by travelers to a below are very important, since ibus can travel very far and talk about them anywhere. Reputation is crucial, because possible mutual agreements between belows are influenced by it. Nobody would like to deal with unreliable, unfriendly belows. As there is no more anonymous mediation by the circulation of money, personal impressions and reputation are essential again. In this regard, belows are like aristocratic lineages, and their image is formed by honor. Taku The first and most remarkable component of sila is a taku, a container made of solid sheet metal or wood. According to the customs of its below, Every ibu gets a taku. Whatever fits into the taku is the ibu's exclusive property, and the rest of the planet is used and held together. Only the ibu has access to the things contained in its taku, nobody else. It can put in it what it wants. It can carry the taku with itself, and no ibu has any right under any circumstances whatsoever to inspect its contents or to ask for information about it, not even in cases of murder or theft. 
The taku is absolutely unimpeachable, holy, taboo, sacrosanct, private, exclusive, personal, but only the taku. The ibu can store in it dirty clothes or machine guns, drugs or old love letters, sankeis or stuffed mice, diamonds or peanuts, stereotapes or stamp collections. We can only guess, as long as it doesn't stink or make noise, i.e. exert influences beyond itself, anything can be in it. As the ibu might be very obstinate, ibu is being notoriously peculiar and perverse, it needs some property. Maybe the idea of property is just a temporary degeneration caused by civilization. But who knows? The taku is a pure, absolute, and refined form of property, but also its limitation. All the ibus together could still imagine to own the whole planet if it helps make them happy. The taku could be important for the ibu, helping it remember, for example, that it is an abu, ubu, gagu, or something else equally unclear unstable, or indefinable. In fact, the single ibu has many other opportunities for minimal security about its identity. Mirrors, friends, psychiatrists, clothes, tapes, diaries, scars, birthmarks, photos, souvenirs, letters, prayers, dogs, computers, wanted circulars, etc. The ibu doesn't need objects in order not to lose its identity in a general ecstasy. Yet the loss of intimate things could be very disagreeable, and therefore should be protected against. Maybe the ibu needs secret intercourse with obscure caskets, collections, fetishes, books, amulets, jewels, trophies, and relics so it can believe itself something special. It needs something to show other ibus when it wants to prove its trust. Only what is secret and taboo can really be shown. Everything else is evident, dull, without charm or glamour. Like unlimited property, the taku brings some risks too, though these are now more concrete and direct. The taku can contain weapons, poisons, magical objects, dynamite, maybe unknown drugs. But the taku can never exert the unconscious, uncontrolled social domination that money and capital do today. There is a limited danger, so trust, reputation, and personal relationships still prove their strength. Kana the kana might be the most frequent and practical subdivision of a below, since the below is probably too large for immediate living together. A kana consists of 15 to 30 ibus, and a below contains about 20 kanas. A kana occupies a larger house in a city, or a couple of houses combined to a single household. It corresponds to a hamlet, a hunting group, a kinship group, a community. The kana is organized around the inner domestic life or hut life, tent life, boat life, yet it is completely defined by the lifestyle and cultural identity of its below. It cannot be independent in its supply of food or goods, for it's too small and therefore too unstable, as the experiences of the 1960s alternative community shows. According to the below lifestyle, there can be more arrangements besides a kana, couples, triangles, nuclear families, parenthoods, household, teams, etc., a below can also consist of 500 single ibus who live together, as in a hotel or a monastery, each on its own, cooperating only at a minimal level to guarantee survival and hospitality. The degree of collectivity or individualism is only limited by these basic necessities. Any ibu can find the bola or kana it likes, or found new ones. Nima Belows can't just be neighborhoods or practical arrangements. That is only their technical, external aspect. The real motivation for ibus to live together is a common cultural background, the nima. Every ibu has its own conviction and vision of life, as it should be, but certain nimas can only be realized if like-minded ibus can be found. In a below, they can live, transform, and complete their common nima. On the other side, those ibus whose nimas exclude social forms, hermits, bums, Misanthropists, yogis, fools, individual anarchists, magicians, martyrs, sages, or witches can stay alone and live in the interstices of ubiquitous, but far from compulsory, belows. The Nima contains habits, lifestyle, philosophy, values, interests, clothing styles, cuisine, manners, sexual behavior, education, religion, architecture, crafts, arts colors, rituals, music, 
dance, mythology, body painting, everything that belongs to a cultural identity or tradition. The Nima defines life as the Ibu imagines it in its practical everyday form. The sources of Nimas are as manifold as they are. They can be ethnic traditions, living or rediscovered ones, philosophical currents, sex, historical experiences, common struggles or catastrophes, mixed forms or newly invented ones. A Nima can be general or quite specific, as in the case of sects or ethnic traditions. It can be extremely original or only a variant of another Nima. It can be very open to innovation or closed and conservative. Nemas can appear like fashions or spread like epidemics and die out. They can be gentle or brutal, passive, contemplative, or active, extroverted. The Nemas are the real wealth of the belows. Wealth equals manifold spiritual and material possibilities. As any type of Nema can appear, it is also possible that brutal, patriarchal, repressive, dull, fanatical terror cliques could establish themselves in certain belows. There are no humanist, liberal, or democratic laws or rules about the content of Nemas, and there is no state to enforce them. Nobody can prevent a below from committing mass suicide, dying of drug experiments, driving itself into madness, or being unhappy under a violent regime. Belows with abandoned Nema could terrorize whole regions or continents, as the Huns or Vikings did. Freedom and adventure generalized terrorism, the law of the club, raids, tribal wars, vendettas, plundering, everything goes. On the other side, the logic of Below Below puts a limit on the practicability and the expansion of this kind of behavior in these traditions. Looting and banditry has its own economics. Furthermore, it's absurd to transpose motivations of the present system of money and property into Below Below. A bandit below must be relatively strong and well organized, and it needs a structure of internal discipline and repression. For the ruling clique inside such a below, this would have to mean permanent vigilance and a high amount of repression work. Their ibus could leave the below at any moment, other ibus could show up, and the surrounding belows would be able to observe the strange evolutions in such a below from the beginning. They could send guests, restrict their exchange, ruin the munu of the bandit below, help the oppressed of the below against the ruling clique, supplying food and other goods getting weapons and equipment would pose severe problems. The Ibus of the bandit below would have to work in the first place to get a basis for the raids, hence the possibility of rebellion against the chiefs. Without a state apparatus on a relatively large scale, repression would require a lot of work. It would not be easily profitable for the oppressors. Raids and exploitation would not be very profitable either, because there is no means to preserve the stolen goods in an easily transportable form no money. Nobody would enter into an exchange with such a below, so it would have to steal goods in their natural form, which means a lot of transportation work and the necessity of repetitious raids. As there are few streets, few cars, scarce means of individual transportation, a bandit below could only raid its neighbors, and would quickly exhaust their resources. Add the resistance of other belows, the possible intervention of militias of larger communities, Tega, Voodoo, Sumi, Yaka, and banditry becomes a very unprofitable marginal behavior. Historically, conquest, plundering, and oppression between nations have always been effects of internal repression and of a lack or impossibility of communication. Both causes cannot exist in Below Below. Belows are too small for effective repression, and at the same time, the means of communication are well developed. Telephone networks, computer networks, ease of travel, etc. In a single below, domination doesn't pay off, and independence is only possible with an agricultural base. Predator belows are still possible, but only as a kind of art for art and for short periods of time. Anyway, why should we start all that again, as we have now at our disposal the experiences of history? And who should be the world controllers if we're not able to understand these lessons? In a larger city, we could find the following belows. Alco below, Sim below, Sado below, Maso below, Veggie below, Les below, Franco below, Italo below, Rosla below, etc. Moreover, there are also just good old regular belows, where people live normal, reasonable, and healthy lives, whatever those are. 
The diversity of cultural identities destroys modern mass culture and commercialized fashions, but also the standardized national languages. As there is no centralized school system, every below can speak its own language or dialect. These can be existing languages, slangs, or artificial languages. Thus, the official languages, with their function as a means of control and domination, decay, and there results a kind of Babylonian chaos, i.e., an ungovernability through disinformation. As this linguistic disorder could cause some problems for travelers or in emergencies, there is Asa Pali, an artificial vocabulary of some basic terms that can be easily learned by everybody. Asa Pali is not a real language, for it consists only of a few words, like Ibu, Below, Sila, Nima, etc., and their corresponding signs, for those incapable of or refusing verbal speech. With the help of Asa Pali, every Ibu can get anywhere the basic necessities like food, shelter, medical care, etc. If it wants to understand better a Below speaking a foreign language, the Ibu will have to study it. As the Ibu now has a lot of time, this should not prove such a problem. The natural language barrier is also a protection against cultural colonization. Cultural identities cannot be consumed in a superficial way. You really do have to get acquainted with all the elements. Spend some time with the people. Kodu The Kodu is the agricultural basis of the below self-sufficiency and independence. The type of agriculture, the choice of crops and methods, is influenced by the cultural background of each below. A veggie below would specialize in vegetables, fruits, etc., instead of cattle raising. An Islam below would never deal with pigs. A Franco below would need a large chicken yard, fresh herbs, and lots of cheese. A Hosh below would plant cannabis. A booze below malt and hops with a distillery in the barn. An Italo below needs tomatoes, garlic, and oregano. Certain belows would be more dependent upon exchange, as their diet is very diversified. Others, with a more monotonous cuisine, could almost entirely rely on themselves. Agriculture is part of the below's general culture. It defines its way of dealing with nature and food. Its organization cannot then be described on a general level. There might be belows where agriculture appears as a kind of work, because other occupations there would be considered more important. Even in this case, Agricultural work wouldn't put grave limits on every single Ibu's freedom. The work would be divided among all the members of the below. This would perhaps mean a month of agricultural work per year, or 10% of the available active time. If agriculture is a central element of a below's cultural identity, there's no problem at all. It would be a pleasure. In any case, everybody would have to acquire some agricultural know-how, even those who do not consider it crucial for their cultural identity because it is a condition for any below's independence. There won't be food stores, nor supermarkets, nor unfairly cheap imports from economically blackmailed countries. There won't be any centralized distribution by a state apparatus either, e.g. in the form of rationing. The below's really have to rely upon themselves. The Kodu abolishes the separation of producers and consumers in the most important domain of life, the production of food. But Kodu isn't just this, it's the whole of the Ibu's intercourse with nature, i.e. agriculture, and nature cannot be understood as two separate notions. The notion of nature appeared the same moment we lost our direct contact with it, as we became dependent upon agriculture, economy, and the state. Without an agricultural basis for self-sufficiency, the Ibu's or Below's are basically exposed to blackmailing. They might have as many guarantees, rights, or agreements as they like. It's all just written on the wind. The power of the state is ultimately based upon its control over food supply. Only on the basis of a certain degree of autarky can the belows enter into a network of exchange without being exploited. As every below has its own land, the division between rural and urban is no longer so pronounced. The conflict of interest between farmers struggling for high prices and consumers demanding cheap food no longer exists. Moreover, nobody can be interested in waste, artificial shortages, deterioration, maldistribution, or planned obsolescence of agricultural products. Everybody is directly interested in the production of qualitatively good and healthy food because they produce and eat it themselves, and they're also responsible for their own medical care. Careful treatment of the soil, the animals, and themselves becomes self-evident. 
for every below is interested in long-term fertility and the preservation of resources. The use of land or other resources and their distribution among belows must be discussed and adapted carefully. There are a lot of possible solutions, according to the situation. For pure countryside belows, agro belows, there are few problems, since they can use the surrounding land. For belows in larger cities, it can be useful to have small gardens around the houses, on the roofs, in courtyards, etc. Around the city, there will be a garden zone where every below would have a larger plot for vegetables, fruits, fish ponds, etc., i.e. for produce that is needed fresh almost every day. These gardens could be reached by foot or bicycle within minutes, and the quantities needing special transport would be relatively low. The real agricultural zone, larger farms of up to 80 hectares, 200 acres, or several farms of smaller size, could be about 15 kilometers or so from the city below particularly in the case of certain cultures using lakes, peaks, vineyards, hunting grounds, etc. These below farms would specialize in large-scale production of durable foods, cereals, potatoes, soya, dairy products, meat, etc. Transportation would be on the scale of tons, by chariot, trucks, boat, etc. For the kodu of large cities, a system of three zones could be practical. For the easy functioning of Kodu, the actual depopulation of larger cities with more than 200,000 inhabitants should continue or be encouraged by belows. In certain areas, this could result in repopulation of deserted villages. There might be pure agro belows, but in general, the Ibu would not have to choose between city or country life. The below farms or hamlets also have the function of country houses or villas, and at the same time, every farmer would have a townhouse below. With the Kodu system, the isolation and cultural neglect of rural regions can be compensated, so that the rural exodus that is today ruining the equilibrium of much of the world can be stopped and inverted. The positive aspects of farm life can be combined with the intense urban lifestyle. The cities would become more city-like, livelier, and the countryside would be protected against its ruin by highways, agro-industries, etc. No farmer would have to stick to his land and be enslaved by his cows. Every city dweller would have a cottage in the country without being confined to the campgrounds or monotonous motels. Yalu. The belows tend to produce their food as close to their central buildings as possible in order to avoid long distances for trips and transportation, which of course mean waste of time and energy. For similar reasons, there will be much less importation of petroleum, fodder, and fertilizers. Appropriate methods of cultivation, careful use of the soil, alternation and combination of different crops are necessary under these conditions. The abandonment of industrialized large-scale agriculture doesn't necessarily result in a reduction of output, for it can be compensated by more intensive methods, since there's a larger agricultural labor force, and by the preference for vegetable calories and proteins, corn, potatoes, soya, and other beans can guarantee their combination a safe basis for alimentation. Animal production, which eats up immense amounts of exactly the above mentioned crops, will have to be reduced and decentralized, as to a lower degree will dairy production. There will be enough meat, but pigs, chickens, rabbits, and sheep will be found around the belows, in courtyards, running around in the former streets so scraps of all kinds can be used in a capillary way to produce meat. Will the below-below cuisine be more monotonous? Will gastronomy decay since the exotic importation and mass production of steaks, chicken, veal, fillets, etc. will be drastically reduced? Will there be a new dark age for gourmet? It's true that you can find a large variety of foods in A-worker supermarkets, coconuts in Alaska, mangoes in Zurich, vegetables in the winter, all kinds of canned fruits and meat. But at the same time, indigenous food is often neglected in spite of its freshness and quality, whereas a variety of locally produced food is reduced for reasons of low output or because its cultivation is too intensive under certain economic conditions. There are costly importations of low quality, tasteless, lame, pale and watery produce from areas where labor power is cheap. It is a fake variety. And for just this reason, the newer French high cuisine has turned to cuisine du marche, i.e. using food that's fresh and locally produced.
mass food production and international distribution is not only just nonsense and a cause for a permanent world hunger crisis, it also just doesn't give us good food. Real gastronomy and the quality of nutrition are not dependent on exotic importations and the availability of steaks. Careful breeding and cultivation, time, refinement, and invention are much more important. The nuclear family household is not adapted to these requirements. Meal times are too short and the equipment too poor, even if highly mechanized. It forces the housewife or other family members to short cooking times and simple preparation. In large kana or below kitchens, there could be an excellent free restaurant in every block, and at the same time, a reduction of work, waste, and energy. The inefficient, low-quality small household is just the counterpart of agro-industrialization. In most cases, cooking is an essential element of the cultural identity of a below, and in this context, it's not really work, but part of the productive, artistic passions of its members. It's exactly cultural identity, NEMA, that brings forward variety in cooking, not the value of the ingredients. That's why a lot of very simple and often meatless dishes of a country or a region are specialties in another place. Spaghetti, pizza, moussaka, chili, tortillas, tacos, sauerkraut, goulash, couscous, pela, etc., are relatively cheap popular dishes in their countries of origin. The possible variety of cultural identities in the belows of a given town produces the same variety of cuisines. In a city, there are as many typical below restaurants as there are belows, and the access to all kinds of ethnic or the cuisines will be much easier. Hospitality and other forms of exchange allow an intense interchange of eaters and cooks between the belows. There is no reason why the quality of these below restaurants, they might even have different forms and settings, shouldn't be higher than those currently existing. Particularly since stress will be reduced, there will be no need for cost calculations, no rush, no lunch or dinner hours. Meal times will also depend on the cultural background of a given below. On the whole, there will be more time for production and preparation of food, as that's part of the essential self-definition of a below. There won't be any food multinationals, any supermarkets, nervous waiters, overworked housewives, cooks on eternal shifts. Since the freshness of ingredients is crucial for good cuisine, gardens near the below are very practical. The cooks can raise a lot of ingredients directly near the kitchen or get them in five minutes time from a nearby garden. There will be a lot of time and space for such small scale cultivation. Many streets will be converted or narrowed, car garages, flat roofs, terraces, decorative lawns, purely representational parks, factory areas, courts, cellars, highway bridges, empty lots, all will yield a lot of ground for herb gardens, chicken yards, hog pens, fish and duck ponds, rabbit hutches, berries, mushroom cultures, pigeonries, beehives. Better air quality will help many of these. Fruit trees, cannabis plantations, vines, greenhouses. During the winter, they can serve as an insulation buffer. The eboos will be surrounded by all kinds of molecular food production. And of course, dogs are edible too. The eboos will have enough time to collect food in woods and other uncultivated areas. Mushrooms, berries, crawfish, mussels, lobster, snails, chestnuts, wild asparagus, insects of all kinds, game, nettles and other wild plants, nuts, beaches, acorns, etc. can be used for the cooking of surprising dishes. Whereas the basic diet can be depending on the below's cultural background, monotonous, corn, potatoes, millet, soya, it can be varied with innumerable sauces and side dishes, if we even assume for the moment of a purely ecological, minimal effort attitude. Another enrichment of the below cuisine is brought to them by traveling eboos, guests or nomads. They introduce new spices, sauces, ingredients, and recipes from far countries. As these kinds of exotic products are only needed in small quantities, there is no transportation problem and they will be available in more variety than today. Another possibility for every Ibu to get to know interesting cuisines is traveling. Since Ibus can take advantage of hospitality everywhere, they can taste the original dishes for free. Instead of transporting exotic products and specialties in a mass way, and with a consequent deterioration of ambience, it's more reasonable to make now and then a gastronomic world tour. As the ibu has all the time at once, 
the world itself has become a real supermarket. Preservation, pickling, potting, drying, smoking, curing, and deep freezing, which are energetically reasonable for a whole kana or below, can contribute to the variety of food all over the year. The larders, the belows, will be much more interesting than our refrigerators nowadays. The different sorts of wine, beer, liquor, whiskey, cheese, tobacco, sausages, and drugs will develop into as many specialties of certain belows and will be exchanged among them, as it was in the Middle Ages when every monastery has its own specialty. The wealth of pleasures that has been destroyed and leveled out by mass production can be reclaimed, and networks of personal relationships of connoisseurs will spread over the whole planet. CB. A below needs not only food, it needs things. Whatever concerns the production, use, or distribution of things is called CB. Thus, CB includes buildings, supplies of fuel, electricity and water, the production of tools and machines, mainly for agriculture, clothing, furniture, raw materials, devices of all kinds, transportation, crafts, arts, electronic hardware, streets, sewage, etc. Like agriculture, kodu, so too, fabric culture, CB, depends on the cultural identity of a given below. A basic part of the CB will be the same in all belows. Maintenance of buildings, simple repairs of machines, furniture, clothing, plumbing, roads, etc. A below will be much more independent than an actual neighborhood or even a family household. As there is no interest in producing defective, disposable, or low-quality products, there will be fewer repairs. Due to the solid and simple design of things, repairs will also be easier. Defects will have less severe consequences. The ability to do the basic craftsman's work and the below itself is also a guarantee of their independence and reduces waste of energy and time. Electricians or plumbers don't have to travel across the whole town. The below is large enough to allow a certain degree of specialization among its members. The main content of CB will be the expression of typical productive passions of a below. Productive passions are in turn directly linked to a below's cultural identity. There might be painter belows, shoemaker belows, guitar belows, clothing belows, leather belows, book belows, photography belows, etc. Certain belows won't specialize and will do many different things. Others would reduce the production and use of many things to a minimum. Dow below. Since people aren't working for a marketplace and only secondarily for exchange, there is no longer any distinction between crafts and arts, vocation, job, working time, free time, inclination, economic necessity, with the exception of some basic maintenance work. Of course, there will be exchange of these typical products and performances between belows, as is the case for agricultural specialties. By means of gifts, permanent agreements, through pools of resources, MAFA, and in local markets, they will circulate and will be compared to other special fairs. In the context of below or even a tega, larger neighborhoods and towns, craftsmen's or small industrial production will be under the direct control of the producers, and they will be able to know and influence the whole process of production. Goods will have a personal character, the user will know the producer, so defective goods can be brought back and there will be feedback between the application and the design, allowing for the possibility of improvement and refining. This direct relationship between producer and consumer will yield a different type of technology, not necessarily less sophisticated than today's mass industrial technology, but more oriented towards specific applications, custom-made, prototypes, independence from big systems, interchangeability, smallness, low energy consumption, easy repairability, etc. Since the fuel for production and use of things is more manifold and less subject to natural limitations than is agriculture, the belows will be more dependent on exchange and cooperation in this sector. Think of water, energy, raw materials, transportation, high-tech, medicine, etc. In these fields, the belows are interested in coordinating and cooperating in higher social levels. Towns, valleys, cities, regions, continents, for raw materials even worldwide. This dependence is inevitable because our planet is just too populated and such interactions are necessary. But in this sector, a below can only be blackmailed indirectly on a mid-term level. Moreover, it has a possibility of directly influencing larger communities 
by means of his delegates. Cooperation in certain fields is also reasonable from the point of view of energy. Certain tools, machines, or equipment can't be used in a single below. Why should every single below have a mill for cereals, construction machinery, medical laboratories, and big trucks? Duplications here would be very costly and demand a lot of unnecessary work. Common use of such equipment can be organized bilaterally or by the townships and other organisms, see Tega, Vudo, Sumi, with machine pools, small factories, deposits of materials, specialized workshops. The same solution is possible for the production of necessary goods that are not and cannot be manufactured in below because there happens to be no shoemaker below in town. So ibus from different belows can combine according to their own inclinations in neighborhood or city workshops. If there are no ibus inclined to do such work, and if at the same time the given community insists upon its necessity, the last solution is compulsory work, kene. Every below is obliged to furnish a certain amount of labor to accomplish its tasks. This could be the case for crucial but unsatisfactory jobs, like guarding shut down nuclear power plants, cleaning the sewage system, road maintenance, pulling down and removing useless highways and concrete structures, etc. Such compulsory work will be exceptional and based on rotated shifts. It cannot strongly interfere with the Ibu's individual preferences. Pali. A below's independence is in fact determined by its degree of self-sufficiency in energy supply. Agriculture and fabric culture can be considered two methods to resolve this problem. Energy, Pali, is needed for agriculture itself, tractors, for transportation, for heating and cooling, for cooking, for mechanical applications, and for energy production itself. Below below is not necessarily a low energy civilization, i.e. low energy consumption is not motivated by ecological efforts, but by a mere consequence of cultural diversity, smallness, avoidance of work intensive processes, lack of control and discipline. High energy systems afford continuous attention, control of controllers, reliability, since the risk of breakdowns is high. Below below we need much less energy because it is just a different lifestyle. Or what is better, a variety of lifestyles, each with a different energy need. Local self-sufficiency, communal life and belows, time instead of speed will all reduce traffic. The consumption of fuel for heating and all kinds of mechanical applications. A large portion of energy is needed today to bring together things or people which have been separated by the functions of a centralized system. Home and workplace, production and consumption, entertainment and living, work and recreation, town and country. Energy consumption rises in proportion to the isolation of a single person's and nuclear families. The size and structure below permits more achievements with less energy consumption, for different applications will also complement and support one another. The blows can apply the different sorts of energy, each in the best way. Electricity will be used for lighting, electronic equipment, mechanical energy, and some means of transportation, railroads, tramways. The basic supply of energy can be produced in the below itself, especially for lighting, by wind generators, solar cells, small river power plants, biogas generators, etc. Passive solar energy, collectors, geothermic systems can be used for heating and hot water. Fuels are only to be used to achieve high temperature for cooking, biogas, wood, coal, or gas, for steam engines in trucks, boats, and generators, or for some combustion engines like gasoline, diesels, kerosene for ambulances, rescue planes, fire engines, emergency vehicles of all kinds. A below is also an integrated energy system where local and external resources can be combined. The waste heat of ovens or machines and workshops can be used for heating because living and workplace are identical in about 80% of the cases. A lot of heated rooms can also be used communally, e.g. baths, hot tubs, drawing rooms, saunas, restaurants. Excrement and garbage can be transformed into biogas, methane, instead of polluting the waters. The size of the belows, the relatively large for this purpose, facilitates an efficient use and distribution of energy since installations and even electronic control systems are in a reasonable relation to the necessary output, which just isn't the case in single buildings or family households. Most new alternative technologies that are actually applied to single houses are pure luxury. 
In warm climates, it below could be up to 90% energy independent. In moderate and cold zones, between 50 and 80%. The belows cooperate between themselves and the rest is taken care of by larger communities, like townships and smaller regions, Tega and Vudo. On a higher level, the autonomous regions, Sumi, conclude agreements on importation and exportation of energy, electricity, coal, petroleum. Moreover, there will be a worldwide coordination for the distribution of fossil fuels. C. Asa Dala. High energy consumption seems to be linked to comfort, a high standard of living, mobility. So will there be hard times when it is drastically reduced? Not at all. Most energy today is used to guarantee the normal industrial workday and not for individual pleasures. The rhythm of this workday, nine to five or else, determines peak consumption, the necessity of a quick and standardized climatization, 21 degrees centigrade and 55% humidity. As work is at the center of everything, there is no time for dealing directly with the energy elements of fire, wind, water, and fuels. Climate, the daily and seasonal rhythm that could bring a lot of diversity and pleasure, is seen as only the source for trouble, since it disturbs work, snow in the winter, rain, darkness, etc. So there's a kind of fake comfort in environmental control that causes an immense expenditure of social effort, but doesn't really yield any real pleasure or enjoyment in warmth or coolness. It's also visible in the need for certain people to have a chimney place right by the central heating radiator. Warmth isn't just a certain calculation in Celsius or Fahrenheit. The intercourse with energy will be linked more to natural conditions. In the winter, there won't be a kind of artificial spring in all rooms. Maybe the temperature will only be 18 degrees centigrade in certain rooms. And only in some really lived in rooms or salons will it be warmer. The eboos may wear more pullovers, live a little closer together, go to bed earlier sometimes, eat more fatty dishes. They'll live winterly, like Minnesota farmers or those who take ski vacations in the mountains. The cold per se is not a real nuisance, ask an Eskimo. Only under the conditions of the standardized workday does it seem impossible. Winter also means that there is less work, agriculture is resting, and more time to deal with bread ovens, heating systems, curling up with books or each other, etc. Some eboos or belows can avoid winter problems by migrating to milder zones, just like certain birds. Since they will be gone for months, this could be energy efficient in spite of the travel. Belows could have some hibernating agreements with each other, and vice versa for the summer. There could be exchanges between Scandinavian and Spanish belows, between Canadian and Mexican ones, between Siberian and South Chinese, between Poland and Greece, between Detroit and Dallas, etc. Suvu. Besides food and energy, water is a crucial element for the survival of the Ibu, if it so desires. Whereas in many parts of the planet, water supply is an unsolved problem, water is wasted in other parts mainly for cleaning and disposal, flushing away excrement or garbage. It's not used in its specific quality as water, suvu, but for easy transportation as sewage. Most of today's washing, flushing, rinsing, cleaning, and showering has nothing to do with physical well-being or with the enjoyment of the element of suvu. The shower in the morning isn't taken for the pleasure of feeling running water, but for the purpose of waking us up and disinfecting us, making our reluctant bodies ready for work. Mass production causes a danger of mass infections and requires hygienic discipline. It's part of the A worker maintenance of labor power for the work machine. Washing, the daily change of underwear, white collars, these are all just rituals of work discipline, serving as a means of control for the bosses to determine the devotion of subordinates. There isn't even a direct productive or hygienic function to many of such tasks. They're just theater for domination. Too frequent, washing and extensive use of soaps, shampoos, and deodorants can even be health hazard. They damage the skin and useful bacterial cultures are destroyed. This disciplinary function of washing is revealed when we stop shaving during vacations, or change our underwear less frequently, or wash less compulsively. Dirt and the right to be dirty can even be a form of luxury. In many parts of this planet, the relationship with dirt, dysfunctional substances, is neurotically charged mainly because of our education or by the disciplinary function of cleanliness. But cleanliness is not objective, but culturally determined. External cleanliness is a form of oppression of internal problems. 
but dirt can never be removed from this world, only transformed or displaced. This is particularly true for the most dangerous sorts of dirt, like chemical or radioactive waste, which the cleanliness syndrome conveniently overlooks. What is removed from the household as dirt appears afterwards in the water mixed with chemical detergents to create an even more dangerous kind of dirt, if a little less visible than before. For this purpose, purification plants are built which demand the production of huge quantities of concrete, steel, etc., even more dirt, caused by industrial pollution. The damage and work that is caused by exaggerated cleaning is in no sane relationship with the imaginary gain of comfort. Cleaning work not only produces dirt in the form of polluted waters, but also exhaustion and frustration in the cleaning workers. Actually, tiring work and drudgery is the most important form of environmental pollution. Why should a polluted body care for the preservation of nature? As the disciplinary functions of washing and most of the large industrial processes that need water will disappear, the belows can reduce the actual consumption of water to at least one third or less. Small communities and processes are clean because all their components and influences can be carefully adjusted and all substances used in their specific way. As the below is large enough to make recycling easy and efficient, most dirt or garbage can be used as raw materials for other processes. Air pollution will be low, pollution by regular work as well, and there is a direct interest in avoiding cleaning work at the source, since it must be done directly by those who cause it. Many belows will be able to achieve self-sufficiency in water supply by collecting rainwater in tanks or by using springs, rivers, lakes, etc. For others, it will be more convenient to organize water supply in the frame of towns, valleys, islands, etc. A lot of belows in arid regions will need the help of other belows on a bilateral or worldwide basis to drill wells or build cisterns. In the past, the problem of water supply has been resolved under extremely difficult conditions, deserts, islands, etc. The actual worldwide water crisis is mainly due to over-urbanization, the destruction of traditional agricultural patterns, and inappropriate introduction of new technologies and products. The use and sufficient availability of water is linked to the cultural background, not just a technical issue.